All engine running. <laughs> Absolute genius. Get this. Welcome. Welcome. To <laughs> this is the show where we bring you science. What that essentially means is discovery, advances, questions, research, technology. Unbelievable. Without further ado, this is the Naked Scientist. Hello and welcome. This is the show that brings you the latest breakthroughs in science, technology and medicine. With me, Phil Sansom. And me, Sally LePage. Coming up, why an eye of fire appeared in the ocean off the coast of Mexico, astronomers pinned down the birth of the first ever stars, and why some COVID tests can be tricked with orange juice. Plus, we're taking a hallucinatory trip into the world of psychedelic drugs. These substances are going through a medical renaissance. We'll learn how they work and how they might help to treat even the most serious psychiatric disorders. The Naked Scientist podcast is powered by UKfast.co.uk. Here in the UK, Prime Minister Boris Johnson has confirmed that the 19th of July will see the country opening up, with the removal of any remaining restrictions on how we socialise, spend leisure time or work. We must be honest with ourselves that if we can't reopen our society in the next few weeks, when will we be able to return to normal? When indeed... And despite climbing numbers of cases, policymakers have justified the easing of controls by pointing out that hospital admissions and deaths remain, thankfully, low. But when Chris Smith spoke to Loughborough University disease modeler Duncan Robertson, he pointed out that when considering the numbers of cases... We're seeing doubling around every nine days. The problem with that, of course, is that we're still getting this link to hospitalizations. Hospitalizations are doubling at around the same rate. How does that compare with what was going on in, say, January and last autumn, October, November, and indeed last April? With January, we had the alpha variant. Rates started to increase very quickly, but there was virtually no vaccination in the population then. What we're seeing now is we're seeing most cases actually happening in, in the unvaccinated. And of course, the unvaccinated are children and young people. But we're starting to see it creep up into the 20-somethings, 30-somethings, 40-somethings. And this is what has happened in the past with uh, cases. They start in young people who are mixing and then move up the age ranges. But is that a valid comparison the past with the present, because obviously the past where no one was vaccinated, we didn't have that protection, which we think is, is pretty good, conferred by vaccination that we do now in those older people. Absolutely right. Vaccination has made a significant difference in terms of how much they go up those age ranges and how fast they go up those age ranges, but they're still going up those age ranges because it's not as though you reach 40 or 50 and everybody's had a vaccination. So still, if you look uh, at the latest figures, we have about nine out of 10 people uh, who have antibodies. Some people in their 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s and above haven't had a vaccination or haven't had a second vaccination. And of course, with this Delta variant, more protection is after that second vaccination. If we look, though, at where we are in terms of the number of people who are in hospital, compared with previous outbreaks, we've got about between 1% and 2% of all of the beds in the NHS currently being used to treat people with coronavirus. Historically, we were getting up to the 40s and 50s of percent. So it's hard to argue this time that we're putting the NHS under pressure so this really comes down to what we think about whether the health system can cope. And uh, I think various people have said that the health service will always cope. Essentially, you have lots of COVID cases that may come in and they, they will always be treated. But of course, you get this difference between should you treat a COVID patient or you, should you treat a non-COVID patient? And that's when you start having these trade-offs and difficult decisions have to be made. And really, it's up to your definition about whether the NHS copes in those situations. I was talking to some senior managers at uh, one of the UK's leading hospitals today, and they told me that they're seeing quite a turnaround in terms of the type of person who they're now caring for with coronavirus compared with previously. They're seeing people who tend to be less ill and stay in hospital for less long. And so they think that actually we should be more optimistic. Absolutely. On average, we're seeing length of stay decrease since last waves. 
But the significant thing is what happens to the number of people in hospital. And even though the average stay may be being below, we still have people who are long stayers, people in intensive care. So as well as looking at the rate of people coming into hospital, we have also had to look at the number of people in hospital. The numbers are really increasing on both. And if you get exponential growth or doubling, of people coming into a hospital, then that poses a significant problem for the number of people in hospital. Yeah, sure. But I think it can grow exponentially, but it doesn't mean it grows exponentially to a point where it compromises care. It certainly has done in the past, but the numbers are much lower now. We've got, say, 20 to 30 people who are passing away compared to, you know, in one case, 1,500 people in a day earlier in the year. The problem is we're still seeing a link between the rate of cases increasing and the rates of hospitalizations increasing. So even though we may have very low levels, it only takes a few doublings for that to become very significant. And really that link between cases and hospitalizations hasn't been broken. So if you allow more and more doublings of cases, you're going to allow more and more doublings of hospitalizations. We'll see what happens there as we approach July the 19th. That was Duncan Robertson. Last week, the ocean caught fire. Twice. Now that's not something you can say every day. Firstly, the Gulf of Mexico hosted a glowing eye of fire, not far from an offshore oil rig. And then, just two days later and on the opposite side of the world, a massive fireball erupted from the Caspian Sea, creating a column of fire that could be easily seen from 45 miles away. I spoke to geologist Mark Tingay from the University of Adelaide to find out what actually happened. There was a leak in a gas pipeline near one of the major oil and gas fields in the Gulf of Mexico. That causes a lot of gas, obviously, to leak out of the pipeline and lightning ignited that bubbling gas and caused the big eye of flame that we all saw on the uh, on social media. It did look incredibly traumatic. It didn't even look real, to be perfectly honest with you. It it was incredible. And yeah, it is something that unfortunately uh, we do see occur whenever we have a major uh, fire associated with a major hydrocarbon leak in oil and gas fields. How can an ocean catch fire? It's surrounded by water. Water puts out fire, doesn't it? Yeah, that's what you think, isn't it? So the water should put out the fire. And in reality, it's not the water that's on fire. It is just the gas. So... All the bubbles of gas, all the methane, natural gas that's coming out of the ground, bubbles up through the water and then once it gets to the surface, it's essentially feeding that fire. But the water itself actually isn't on fire. It just looks like it. The images from that were, for me, it seemed like a kind of once in a lifetime sort of image. But then it happened again. We had a second fire in the oceans, this time in the Caspian Sea. What happened there? Was it the same deal? The fire in the Gulf of Mexico was a broken gas pipeline near an oil platform. The fire in the Caspian Sea was actually a perfectly natural event where we had a big fireball that jetted out from the eruption of a major mud volcano on a very small island in the Caspian Sea. Wow, I've never even heard of a mud volcano before. What is a mud volcano? So a mud volcano is a part of the earth where subsurface water and mud essentially come out of the ground. So if you think about a volcano, a normal volcano, those erupt molten rock and ash. A mud volcano is a bit like that, but it erupts watery mud. And along with it, it can also erupt a lot of gas. How big are they? Do they look like the mountains that we think of when we think of a volcano? Most of them in the world are very small things that might only be tens of metres in size. The ones in Azerbaijan are quite unusual in that they do look like real volcanoes. They can be hundreds of metres tall. So you've got this liquid mud, you've got these bubbles of natural gas erupting. What then sets that off to create what was such a dramatic mushroom cloud going into the sky of fire? We're not 100% sure because, of course, it's not something that we can easily test. But there's two main ideas One is that it's just the very sharp drop in pressure. There's been a lot of simulation that suggests that just the very sharp drop in pressure could be enough to ignite the gas on its own. But I think another possibly quite likely situation is that when you've got all this very violent eruption of mud, it's not just water and clay. It's got boulders inside, rocks, cobbles, big chunks that can be half the size of a car. 
And these are things being violently thrown into the air. And of course, they can bang together and potentially cause a spark. And you really just need one spark to ignite that huge amount of gas. So this is the natural equivalent of striking two flints together. That's right, yes. What are the environmental consequences of these fires happening in these oceans? The fires, it's a good question, and I'm not exactly sure what the consequences are going to be of, for example, the Pemex fire. If it's mostly gas, then it's of the, most of the gas would have burnt, and so your biggest issue there is, of course, the emissions and its contribution to climate change. The real concern would have been how much gas might have been dissolved in the, in the seawater and if there was any oil that also was released, which, of course, we know from oil spills can cause huge devastation over a large area. Pemex has denied that there was any environmental damage or major oil spill. From mud volcanoes, of course, it's a natural phenomenon. They do happen quite regularly in that part of the world. They do erupt quite a lot of oil. They can erupt quite a lot of gas. I haven't heard of any oil spills visible from the mud eruption in the Caspian. The impact on the environment there is probably quite minimal, and of course it's a natural event, but mud volcanoes do contribute significantly to Earth's natural methane budget that of course we take into account when we're looking at the impact on the climate cycle. Thanks to Mark Tingay, and fingers crossed the ocean stays fire-free for now. Welcome to the Naked Gaming Podcast with me, Chris Barrow. And me, Lee Milner. Every month we look at the latest gaming news. This was built by DeepMind um, and it was called Alpha Zero. We review the biggest releases. Can I just say, he's a bold assassin. He's also a really smartly dressed one. His, his suit must come from Hugo Boss. And because there's a simulator for almost anything, we play some of the strangest ones available. You're sort of uh, playing as a very... Um destructive puppy shall we say but then again if you've ever had a dog the naked gaming podcast from the naked scientists download it now wherever you get your podcasts coming up how kids have been faking covid tests to get out of school and it, it's like the holy grail of psychotherapy a, a tool that allows a patient to go to a usually repressed and avoidant memory and to be able to do the work on that drug can you guess what that drug might be it might surprise you because later on we'll be exploring the new world of psychedelic medicine yes but first let's go back to the early universe it may have started with a Big Bang, but the first stars and galaxies didn't shine until much later, during what we call the Cosmic Dawn. And up until now, we haven't had a very good idea of when this Cosmic Dawn happened, but some researchers from the UK and America think that they finally pinned it down, using some measurements that literally look back in time to those first galaxies. Richard Ellis is an astrophysicist from UCL who led the study, and he's here with us. Richard, can you tell us, how far back are we actually talking when we're talking about this cosmic dawn? Well, the universe itself is 13.8 billion years old. So that's about three times older than the Earth. And we're looking back about 97% of the way back to the beginning. So we're looking back to when the universe was in its infancy, only a few hundred million years old. That seems extraordinarily long ago to actually be physically looking at. Yeah, well, let's try to understand this. So the universe is a very big place and light travels at a fixed speed. So when we use our powerful telescopes, we're time travelers. We're looking back in time. So the light rays have taken so long to reach us uh, that we're looking at those sources as they were, not today, but as they were in the distant past. So uh, the work that my group at UCL has done is to look at six of the most very distant objects. They're seen when the universe was 550 million years old. So that's about 5% of the present age of the universe. But we studied these objects in detail and determined how old they, the stars in those galaxies were at that particular time. So we can then backtrack from that moment and say, well, when did those galaxies actually switch on their stars for the very first time? These objects that you're looking at, Richard, if they're mm. so far away, how can you work mm. out how actually old the stars within them are? Because you must, the, right. the images that you get and the readings must be very, very vague and blurry. 
Yeah, these galaxies don't look familiar at all. They're physically little blobs. They're very, they're about, uh, just to put it in context, our own galaxy is the Milky Way. And these galaxies are about a 20th of the size of the Milky Way. But they're in their infancy. They're forming stars very, very rapidly. Now, to age date, in other words, to figure out how old a, a group of stars is, astronomers have a well-known trick that has been calibrated and used very successfully for stars in our own Milky Way, which looks at a feature of hydrogen in the atmospheres of the stars, which tells us how massive the, the star is and particularly how old it is. And with Hubble and uh, other facilities with these six galaxies, we've been able to measure this hydrogen feature and determine the age of each of these galaxies individually. They're not all the same age. Some of them are younger than others. And so the impression we're getting is, you know, that cosmic dawn wasn't, you know, just some sort of, you know, Monday morning, it switched on and that was it. You know, it it occurred over... Right, let there be light. A, Not yeah, so much. it occurred over a period of 100 million years or so. Why is this important for us today? Are there sort of ramifications that we can take from this big prolonged switch on? Yeah, let's let's talk about that. Why is this important? Well, firstly... These early stars, these first generation of stars, are, only have two chemical elements in them, hydrogen and helium. These are the only chemical elements that are formed soon after the Big Bang, when the, when the universe began. All the heavier elements, including the stuff that makes up you and me, was material that was synthesized in stars. So by going back to this moment, we're in a sense, we're looking at the origin of everything we see around us, including our own bodies. God, when did all this happen? When did this begin? And the answer, since you haven't asked me, is 250 <laughs> to 350 million years after the Big Bang. We were getting to that. Now, 250 say, to yeah, 350 million two, years. That's right. Now, let me say something else about why this is important. And that is astronomy doesn't change breakfast or you know, do very much for our daily lives. But I think it inspires people, particularly young kids, to get into science and engineering. And Cosmic Dawn, with a name like that, could make a good breakfast cereal that could get kids yeah, interested be, yeah, as yeah. well. <laughs> Richard Ellis, thank you so very much. You can read about Richard's research in monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society. Now, let's move on from stars to soft drinks, because there have been reports that kids are using them to fake their COVID tests to get out of school. You can actually find out how to do this on TikTok, and apparently all you need is some orange juice or cola. But is it true? And if it is true, how does it all work? Eva Higginbotham reports. Many of us are familiar with lateral flow tests by now, the small plastic COVID tests that we can do rapidly at home. But fewer of us actually know how they work, myself included. I didn't know that they even have gold in them. How much money do you think I could make if I collect all the lateral flow tests I can find and take the gold out? Uh, pennies, probably. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, you know what? I might have to go and do, do the calculation to figure out. Just That's chemist much. Mark Lorch from the University of Hull. And when he heard reports about people faking positive lateral flow tests using various soft drinks, he took it upon himself to figure out how on earth this works. But first, here's how lateral flow tests are supposed to work. After swabbing the back of your throat and nose and mixing the swab with a little buffer solution, you put a drop of the solution onto the sample window, otherwise known as the S window, of the test. This liquid gets pulled along this absorbent strip of material inside and along the way will be exposed to specialised antibodies. Now, your immune system makes antibodies, these protein molecules that are highly specific in what they will bind to, in reaction to foreign invaders in your body. But scientists can also engineer antibodies to bind to whatever they like, and can stick colourful chemicals onto them too. So in this case, they made some antibodies that are highly specific to the coronavirus and are bound to little tiny nanoparticles of gold, which, surprisingly, look more purple and reddish than what we normally think of gold. If your sample contains coronavirus particles, then these colourful antibodies will bind to the virus particles. These then get stuck to a second set of antibodies halfway up the test, at the T or test window, which is why you would see a reddish purple line there if you've tested positive. 
There's a third set of antibodies involved too, stuck at the C or control line. These antibodies will bind to the other antibodies used in the test and are there to show you that the test has worked. If you get a control line and no test line, you have a negative test. If you have a control line and a test line, you have a positive test. But, as Mark said, there are reports of kids faking positive tests using soft drinks. I wanted to see it for myself, so got Mark to talk me through it. Okay, so I've got myself some orange juice. Unfortunately, it's got bits in. Is this going to be a problem? I, I don't know, actually. I've never tested this with bits in, the, the orange juice with bits in. So this is this is groundbreaking science going on here. Do you get a apparently positive result on electoral flow test if you use orange juice with bits in? Let's find out. All right, so I'm going to squeeze a couple drops then onto yeah. the sample window, just as I would if I was taking it myself. And I haven't mixed this with the buffer solution. This is just straight up orange juice. What's happening now then is that that orange juice is is wicking up the device. It's picking up the red nanoparticles attached to the antibody and it's carrying on up the lateral flow test. And I can see a line where the T is. And it's actually, it's getting stronger as the seconds go by. It's just past the C now and it's getting stronger there too. So there you go. Well, there we go. You heard it here first. Orange juice with bits in does give you a fake positive <laughs> natural flow test result for COVID. All right. So what is going on? Why does this happen? Good question. Now, the thing that I've noticed is that all the fluids that create this fake positive result, they are all acidic. So colas, orange juice and so on, they're all about pH three and four. So they're quite acidic solutions. Now, the antibodies have evolved to work in very different conditions. They work in your bloodstream, which is about pH 7.3, so almost neutral. And the acidity of these drinks and so on is then quite an alien environment to the antibodies. Now, antibodies are proteins, and proteins are really quite sensitive to the, the conditions around them, particularly the pH. And by putting the antibodies then in acidic conditions, what essentially is happening is you're starting to unfold the antibodies. So antibodies, like all proteins, are long chain-like molecules that fold up into a very well-defined shape to do their job correctly. And when you put them in acidic conditions, you cause the antibodies to unfold slightly. It essentially destroys the specificity of the antibodies for the virus instead makes them stick to all sorts of other things in the solution most obviously the gold nanoparticles and that's what results then in that line at the t point so there you go it comes down to the fact that antibodies often have quite a specific ph range that they operate at much like how the enzymes in your stomach that help break down food work best in an acidic environment and what if you want to check if a positive test is real or not Mark told me that you can let it dry out over a few hours and then add some buffer solution to the sample window. This will wick up the test and, over time, reset the pH to about neutral, causing the antibodies to get back into their proper shape. If the test is fake, the T-line will disappear. And you'll know to start keeping a closer eye on the orange juice in your fridge. That was Eva Higginbotham with Mark Lorch. And just drinking or eating certain foods before doing those tests could also trigger a false positive. So try to avoid doing one straight after breakfast. Now a story about one of my favourite animals, the sea otter. Being the smallest of the marine mammals, not to say the cutest, otters have had to adapt to their cold and wet environment. They have the thickest fur of any animal and on top of that an incredible ability to generate body heat. It's that second feature that recently got some American scientists interested. How are otters so good at turning the energy from their food into heat? It turns out that inside their mitochondria, the parts of their cells that generate energy, the normally sound membranes are a little bit leaky, which lets energy get released as heat rather than, say, used to contract a muscle. Trey Wright from Texas A&M University told me about the process, as well as about the impressive otters themselves. They're really interesting animals because they've got this really high metabolic rate. It's about three times the metabolic rate that you would expect for an animal of their size. And we think that this high metabolic rate is really because they're trying to generate heat. Being a small mammal living in cold waters, it's really challenging for them to maintain their body temperature. 
when you say metabolic rate, what exactly do you mean? Well, metabolism is really just how these animals break down fats and sugars to use them and, and make energy in a form that they can use. And what our research looked at is the muscle itself. Muscle makes up a big chunk of the body mass of these animals. It uses a lot of energy. So it made sense for us to look at how these animals are, are consuming energy in the muscle tissue. How do you do that? Do you, do you get an actual otter and you put it in your lab somewhere and you feed it a bunch of stuff or, or something different? Yes. No, what we do is we actually had small pieces of muscle. And so we can test specifically how that muscle metabolizes this energy. Here we found that the sea otter muscle was very good at being inefficient. It had a capacity to make a lot of heat, but if your main goal is to stay warm, that's really helpful. I don't understand. How is inefficiency good in this situation? Well, think of a light bulb. The old incandescent bulbs were really inefficient. They could make the same amount of light as an LED bulb, but they generated a lot of heat and used up a lot of energy to do it. That's a bad thing when it comes to your energy bill, but it's a good thing if you actually want to heat up a room. So that's what these otters are doing. They're metabolizing this energy, but they're doing it inefficiently. As a byproduct, they're heating their body. Do you have any idea what specific part of the metabolic process is being inefficient? Most of that energy is derived from inside the mitochondria. And the mitochondria pump protons across a membrane. Well, instead of using that proton gradient to power work, they get protons leaking across the membrane. So you're saying it's an inefficiency in this kind of proton pumping mechanism? Yes. That proton gradient isn't able to be used to make functional work. And does this actually explain their high metabolic rate in the first place? Or is this just how they get their heat from their metabolic rate that they already have? Yes. Well, this leak metabolism is able to account for this really revved up high metabolism of these animals. And one of the really interesting things of our study was that this metabolic capacity and this leak metabolism were just as high in the neonates as they were in the adults. Typically, you don't think of the metabolism as developing until the muscle is really mature. But these guys seem to have a really high metabolic capacity, even when they're newborns. The other consequence, of course, is that otters must be you know, pretty hungry little folks. They mostly. are. Uh, just like we <laughs> talked about earlier with the, uh, the light bulb, you may have a really high energy bill if you're using this inefficient means of converting energy. And these guys do. They spend about 20 to 50 percent of their day feeding and can consume up to 25 percent of their body mass a day. Makes me kind of hungry too. I can't imagine eating that much. <laughs> Trey Wright. That study was published in the journal Science. And now it's time for the mailbox, the part of the show where we respond to your messages. This week, listener Jeff emailed us saying that he's been double COVID jabbed, but started getting hay fever symptoms like coughing, sneezing and runny eyes. He subsequently took a couple of lateral flow tests, the first one was negative, but the later one was positive for COVID. This aligns with broadcaster Andrew Marr's experience. He also had cold-like COVID symptoms after being double jabbed. So this all goes to show that if you've had both vaccine doses and you catch COVID again, the symptoms might not be the ones you're expecting. Jeff, this observation is also backed up by evidence from the Zoe Symptom Tracker app. They say that the top most common symptoms for those who've had both doses are now a headache, a runny nose, sneezing, sore throat, and loss of smell. And a cough and a fever are now a good way further down the list. Now, this isn't 100% conclusive evidence, and the Symptom Tracker app obviously isn't catching everyone, but something to maybe watch out for. And if you at home would like to ask us anything, you can go to the form on our website, nakedscientists.com forward slash question, or you can send an email into chris at nakedscientists.com. 
Much has changed for business owners, managers and staff recently. But with over 30 years experience in telecommunications, award-winning independent company Spitfire have the expertise to make sure you stay ahead and can keep on innovating. Whether it's connectivity, MPLS networks, firewalls or phone systems, Spitfire can help. To find out more, go to spitfire.co.uk. That's spitfire.co.uk. Spitfire, telecoms and IP engineering solutions for business since 1988. Music in the programme is sponsored by Epidemic Sound, perfect music for audio and video productions. In the second half of this programme... Turn on, tune in and drop out. You might recognise psychologist Timothy Leary, whose famous motto there, advocating for psychedelic drugs like LSD, helped drive the counterculture of the 1960s. But psychedelics, as they're sometimes called, have been banned in this country and many others ever since. Over the last decade, scientists have rediscovered psychedelics, both as tools to research the inner workings of the brain and as ways to treat some of the most serious mental health conditions. But are these drugs really a new frontier in science? Or is it all just a trippy dream? And before that, we need to know what these psychedelics actually are. And University of Liverpool epidemiologist Susie Gage is the expert. She's the author of the book, Say Why to Drugs?, Susie, when people talk about psychedelic drugs, what specific drugs do they mean? I think broadly, when people talk about psychedelics, they're talking about kind of what we refer to as the classical psychedelics. So these are LSD, psilocybin, which is the active compound in magic mushrooms, DMT, which is sometimes known as ayahuasca. But there are other there are other psychedelic substances as well. So mescaline is another one which is found in cacti. Some people say that cannabis can induce sort of perceptual changes. Um, Ketamine and PCP, which are dissociative anaesthetics, they can induce sort of hallucinations and things like that. Maybe even MDMA as well. Right. That's that's quite a lot of drugs. Why are they all (laughs) linked together under this label then of, of psychedelic? Well, the term psychedelic is thought to have been coined in the 50s by a British uh, psychiatrist. And it's from Greek. It it translates roughly as sort of mind manifesting. It became more widely used in the 60s. Timothy Leary in particular, who you've just Mm. mentioned, was a big advocate of the term. And so psychedelic substances became linked with a whole psychedelic culture linked to sort of music and an aesthetic as well. What does one of these psychedelic trips actually feel like? I mean, to the best of your knowledge. Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. (laughs) Because when we think about um, taking a psychoactive substance, so a recreational drug, we might all understand what it feels like to be intoxicated on alcohol. And if you see someone else intoxicated on alcohol, they have quite a lot of um, sort of signs that you can see what that looks like. I mean, sure, singing three lines, for example, I was gonna say there's lots of those people on the news (laughs) right now. Um, Psychedelic intoxication is very kind of personal and inward facing. So it can cause perceptual changes. People report visual hallucinations, patterns moving, synesthesia, where two senses become connected. It can also have an emotional impact. So it can impact on how you feel, sort of how how you feel about who you are. It can bring memories or feelings to the surface. But it's quite a hard thing to describe. When I wrote the book, I interviewed people about their experience. And someone said, well, trying to describe it is like trying to describe colour to someone who's never been able to see. I, I mean, is it a good experience or is it a bad, scary experience? I think it can be both and potentially even in the same experience can be positive and negative. Um, That's what people that I spoke to, people that I interviewed, how they described it to me is that sometimes they had quite negative experiences. One person said at one point she felt like she might have seriously damaged her mental health and she wasn't going to come back from it, which sounds absolutely terrifying. But people, when I spoke to them, were also at pains to say that even when they had a negative experience, they actually got quite a lot out of that after they uh, were no longer intoxicated. How how do you mean? Like sort of understood themselves better perhaps after these experiences. I mean, some people had bad experiences and didn't enjoy it and would never do it again as well. It's important to say that. I mean, is that the danger of these drugs then, that you can have that bad experience or, or are they addictive as well? Well, they don't seem to be addictive in terms of the way we think about 
a substance becoming dependence forming, let's say. So obviously you can be addicted to anything if it negatively impacts on things like your work or your home life, if you become so determined to sort of take it regularly and it throws your life off kilter. But with quite a lot of other psychoactive substances, like think about alcohol and tobacco, um, these are dependence forming. So you get a physical or mental dependence on them as, as well as this kind of potential to be addicted in a more broad sense. And psychedelics don't seem to have that at all. They also don't seem to have or seem to be much far lower risk in terms of toxicity. Like if you take too much of alcohol, for example, you can be very ill, or it can be fatal. And that doesn't really seem to be the case with with psychedelics you'd have to take an extremely extremely large amount probably an impractically large amount to experience toxicity from these substances but as but as we've said that doesn't mean that they're safe these unpleasant effects from psychedelics are more likely to be mental than physical although having said that it's also important to point out that there is the potential for injuries from behaviors undertaken while intoxicated as is also the case for things like alcohol as well so interesting thank you so much susie that was Susie Gage. Pretty much all these psychedelic drugs, even if they are synthesised in a lab, are based on products found in nature. The question then is, why does nature produce all these compounds that make you see colours and feel at one with the universe? Well, that's what an American team set out to answer when they looked into how magic mushrooms have evolved. Hannah Reynolds from Western Connecticut State University told Eva Higginbotham how they did it. There's actually over 200 species of magic mushrooms and they're uh, scattered all over the world and a lot of them aren't even very closely related to each other. And we were looking to understand what are the genes that actually make the psychedelic compound psilocybin and then we wanted to understand how did these genes evolve And how do they make that psilocybin? So what they're starting with is the amino acid tryptophan. And this is what, if you eat a lot of turkey at the holidays, this is the thing that people say makes you sleepy. It's been debated whether it's just having a giant meal makes you sleepy or if it's really tryptophan. (laughs) But they start with tryptophan and then they do basically five chemical transformations. And each of the steps needs a different gene. So those were the genes that we were searching for. And how did you go about looking for them? Uh, So what we did is we took six mushrooms. Three were psilocybin producers and three were not. And we did genome sequencing of all six. And then what we were looking for is what are the genes that are shared just between the three magic mushrooms and not the others? That left us with a fairly small pool of genes because we were ignoring the genes that were just essential for a cell to survive and to grow. And once we had that pool, we looked for the functions and we basically found this gene cluster. And they also were close to each other on the chromosome. How do you know that these genes that you found are the ones that make psilocybin? How can you test that? Great question. So uh, what we did is take the gene sequence and then get the protein from it and then gave it tryptophan, and it made the product that we expected. We in the United States had to stop there because of regulations that, at the time, we were not allowed to create, I think they're called like class one drugs. But another team independently found the same genes in a different genome of mushrooms, and they were able to take these enzymes and make psilocybin from them. And so the fact that all of these genes were clustered together in the same place of the genome of the mushroom, yeah. can we learn anything from that about how those genes might have evolved? Yes. In fungi, when we see that kind of pattern, sometimes that's associated with a history of horizontal gene transfer, gene jumping, if you will. I see. So it's not like all the mushrooms across the world all independently were like, you know what, let's make some psilocybin. It's more like mushrooms that were next to each other shared the genes required to make psilocybin. And through that mechanism, it spread. Yes. So that was kind of our final step to our paper was looking at, you know, what might those environments have been? And the environments that magic mushrooms are usually found in are dung, decaying wood, and mutualistic associations between fungi and tree roots. And it looked like the dung environment 
was where a lot of these exchanges might have happened. And what is the point of these mushrooms making the psilocybin in the first place? What benefit do they get from it? Well, what we think is that in the environments where the magic mushrooms are growing, they are having to deal with insect, especially insect larvae that are eating the decaying wood, that are eating the dung, and that maybe even are eating them, especially as they're growing through that resource before they actually make the mushroom itself. So we think that making these hallucinogenic compounds may slow down the insect enough that the mushrooms have a better chance of colonizing that material and actually growing and making a mature mushroom. So it's about competition. That's our um, our take on it. And what does it do to an insect? If an insect eats a magic mushroom, is it going to get high? Are they like hippies? I think they do. I mean, what it feels like to them, I don't know. But I suspect that their brains aren't that different from ours in terms of what this does. And of course, insects are living in a more smell-based world than a visual-based world. So I can only speculate, but I would think if they hallucinate, they're not so much getting visuals as maybe olfactory confusion. That's amazing. That's, that's a wild guess. That's a what smelling I hallucination. And how would I even test something like that? I have no idea, <laughs> but uh, that's what I imagine. Forget LSD sounds more like smell SD. Hannah Reynolds there. And you can read about that research in the journal Evolution Letters. We're halfway through our ABC of LSD, our exploration of psychedelic drugs. We've heard what they are and where they come from. Now we'll find out their uses in medicine. And with us now is David Nutt, head of Imperial College London's Centre for Psychedelic Research. When the centre opened in 2019, it was the world's first dedicated institute for this kind of research, looking at how these drugs actually work in the brain and whether these effects might be useful to treat problems with mental health. David, let's start with that first part. Do we know what these drugs are actually doing to the brain? We do now because we have brain imaging techniques which have shown very clearly that these drugs have a very profound uh, disruptive effect on ongoing brain activity. And we also know that this effect is mediated through targeting serotonin receptors. These are the proteins that serotonin works on in the brain. And there's a, there are 15 different serotonin receptors, but these hallucinogens all work on a very special one called the 5-HT2A receptor, which is peculiarly um, dense in human brain. It's got a very snappy name, that one. What does it do? <laughs> well, there are people that think it's responsible for the evolution, uh, the, the vast expansion of the human brain in recent evolution. My own view is it's laid in parts of the brain where uh, we do our very high-level thinking, our, our looking backwards, looking forwards, where we have our dreams and our imaginations. And I think it coordinates, essentially, the laying down of new ideas and new, new ways of thinking, new ways of dealing with problems, which is why, in the end, I think it, these drugs have turned out to be useful in conditions like uh, mental illness and depression. So when we take these drugs, what does it do to our overall brain if it's affecting these single little receptors? The high-level parts of your cortex, the, the thinking parts, the parts which integrate your hearing, your seeing, your touch, etc., they get disrupted by psychedelics. And psychedelics, in a very simple way, put you back to what your brain was like when you were a child when all kinds of connections were possible. I mean, you're, you're, the process of neurodevelopment is actually not of growing a brain, it's actually of shrinking the brain, of getting rid of connections which you don't want. And, and over the decades from childhood, the brain becomes more and more constricted in what it does and more and more rigid. And psychedelics disrupt that and put you back transiently into that state of childhood wonder. So growing up is like doing topiary on your brain and then taking these psychedelics is letting the brain, the plant, just grow wild again so you can kind of start from scratch? Yeah, that's right. It's a kind of reset. It's a, a lot of our patients uh, describe the influence of uh, a psilocybin treatment as being like a defrag of a hard drive or, or, or a reformatting, and, and it allows people to break out of ways of thinking often depressed people, for instance, they get locked into thinking the same thought time and time again. I made a mistake. I shouldn't have done this. I was a bad person. And they can't escape that thinking because our brains are extraordinarily efficient 
at learning to do things. But if they learn to do the wrong thing and have the wrong thought, they're very hard to disrupt. And psychedelics are probably the most powerful way of disrupting that kind of unwanted thinking. And does this disruption explain the other side effects we see, like the hallucinations and feeling at one with the universe? Absolutely, absolutely. In fact, that's what we discovered first. The reason we started treating depressed people with psilocybin was because we saw that the ability of psilocybin to disrupt the networks of the brain which contain thinking is the same as its ability to disrupt the networks which control vision and its sense of self and position and place in the universe. So visual hallucinations, they're really remarkable because under psychedelics, your visual cortex temporarily is unable to properly reconstruct the signals in the eye into images. And those simple hallucinations, we know from sophisticated electrophysiological experiments, that those are the very early ways in which you reconstruct what you see. So under psychedelics, you actually see the primary workings of your visual cortex, which is actually, I think, extraordinarily interesting and cute and something which you haven't experienced since you were a child. David Nutt, thank you so much. And we'll be coming back to you in just a moment. Now, what about the other part of the coin, the potential use of these drugs in treating mental health disorders? Well, this kind of research isn't limited to Imperial College London. There are trials going on all around the UK and in other countries. In Bristol, a company called Awaken Life Sciences is trialing the use of MDMA to treat addiction. MDMA isn't a classical psychedelic drug. In fact, as a rave drug, it's also known as ecstasy. But as psychiatrist Ben Sessa told me in the clinic, it has some surprisingly useful properties. MDMA has an amazing capacity to induce a state of empathy and to turn off the fear response. Now, this is very important with people who have trauma-related disorders, particularly addictions, post-traumatic stress disorder. It's very difficult for people to do therapy with these disorders because the trauma is so intense they can't recall the painful memories without wishing to flee and end the treatment. MDMA has a remarkable quality to turn off the fear and allow you this brief few hours in which to carry out trauma-focused psychotherapy. Oh, interesting. So can you still remember what you're thinking about, but you don't, you don't feel afraid? Absolutely. Um, It's quite pharmacologically unique, MDMA, in that it just turns off the fear response whilst leaving the other faculties intact. Based on the study that you've done, how well does it actually work? It was what we call an open-label pilot study, and we need to do some randomised control studies to further that research. But the outcomes were very positive indeed. With the control group, around 75% of people at nine months had returned to pre-detox levels of drinking, compared to just 20% in those that underwent our MDMA therapy. That does sound like a big change. What's the link, though, between trauma, which MDMA is helping people kind of access, and alcoholism? There so often is trauma, particularly childhood trauma, abuse and maltreatment that um, emerges very early in life and causes disruption to a person's attachment relationship. Now, the attachment relationship is the blueprint for our psychological functioning throughout life. And it's very well known that damage to attachment relationships is associated with most, if not all, chronic mental disorders. So it's no surprise that those patients who become addicted to drugs of all kinds so often have these difficult childhood childhoods and poor attachment relationships. So is it as simple in in your studies as you give people a pill and and then they feel better? Because I think people are quite wary about the idea that you can solve a mental health problem, got so many different causes with, with like a single drug. Absolutely. And I think the interesting thing about psychedelic research in general is this is the antithesis of the way we currently use drugs in psychiatry. Most mental health medications one takes on a daily basis for weeks, months, decades in order to mask symptoms. The interesting thing about psychedelic assisted psychotherapy is you only need to take the drug on a few occasions mixed with psychotherapy. And that's where it really works. Oh, so it's it's talk, 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 drug. Talk, 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 talk. Yes, the the bulk of the work is done is in the non-drug post-integration sessions. You you rarely get a one-size-fits-all medicine in, in the field. So how many people does this actually seem to work for? Well, the results of psychedelic research of the last 15 years have been staggeringly good for a range of different compounds, psilocybin, 
ketamine, MDMA, across a wide range of psychiatric disorders, including addictions, anxiety disorders, depression. So it remains to be seen how well psychedelics could be used in psychiatry. But so far, the results suggest that the applications could be very wide indeed across multiple disorders. Indeed, we may one day look back and think, why did we ever do psychotherapy without drug assistance with psychedelics? You really think it's that big of a deal? We have to be very careful not to get ahead of ourselves here. One of the reasons this research died in the 60s was because there was too much of a messianic approach that these drugs were panaceas. They're not panaceas. Mental health is complex. There's psychological factors, social factors, as well as biological and genetic factors. But it certainly seems looking at the results of the last 15 years, that the results are extremely good indeed. Where do you think this is going then, Ben? Am I going to be able to go to my GP and they prescribe me some MDMA? If the research continues at the pace it's going, then we should see MDMA approved as a drug to treat trauma-based disorders in around 2023. Psilocybin, a couple of years after that. Ketamine is already available for the treatment of these um, disorders. And one of the big goals we have is to make sure that this appears on the public health service. It's no good if it's just confined to private medicine. So we need to work with the regulatory authorities and with the funding authorities to make sure that this is free public access health care for everyone. Psychiatrist Ben Sessa. David, let's leave Ben's predictions to the side for just a moment and talk about the clinical research because Ben was doing trials on MDMA for addiction. Are you doing similar studies? And if so, have you got any results? So our primary target has been depression. We've done two trials of psilocybin in depression. The first showed it was the most powerful treatment ever for resistant depression. A single trip produced 50% reductions in depression scores within a a day. And many found quite long-lasting benefits. A few of those people from that first trial are well eight years later. And then we went on to compare it with a conventional antidepressant, an SSRI called escitalopram. And again, we found it worked uh, on most um, range of symptoms better than the the SSRI. So now we're moving to other disorders. We're currently in Imperia. We're doing a study in anorexia. And we're setting up a study in obsessive compulsive disorder. And you might say, well, what have they got to do with depression? And, and the answer is that those three disorders are all what we call internalizing disorders. They're all disorders where people get locked into thinking, ways of thinking that they don't want to be locked into, but they can't escape. And we think that psychedelics might have the power to break down that overlearned, that sort of repetitive stereotype thinking. A 50% reduction in depression scores is a a, a big claim. Can you be absolutely sure that that's not some sort of extra placebo that they get from the actual trip itself? Well, there's clearly a placebo effect of um, of being involved in intensive research treatments. But uh, comparing it with the best antidepressant we've got, which is what we've just done, one of the best antidepressants and shown we get significant benefit over and above that, convinces me that this is actually a very powerful, it's more powerful probably than any other treatment we've had. And, and does it last? Well, for some people it does, but for others it doesn't. And, and this is the big challenge now. The real research direction now is to see how we can maintain the effect. And it may be we have to give top-up treatments, maybe two or three times a year. And, or it might be we want to do something else. We want to get people well and then keep them well, perhaps with a traditional antidepressant or, or some other kind of psychotherapy. That's where the real research challenges uh, over the next few years. And so, David, are you suggesting that people with depression go out and take LSD, pop some magic mushrooms, you know? Definitely not, no, because we know that when people with depression have a psychedelic experience, it's generally not pleasant. It's challenging. They often go back to the traumas which led them to be depressed in the first place. We really don't recommend self-medication because you could have a bad trip, which could be very distressing. And our trips are obviously always looked out, you know, people are always looked after by therapists. But beyond that, we think there's a real benefit for having the therapist there the next day for what we call the integration session. And that's when people talk about the experience, tell the therapist what they saw, and the therapist then helps them make sense of their illness. But more importantly, makes helps them develop ways to recover from the depressive thinking. Thank you so much, David Nutt. So interesting. And thank you for joining us. Also, a great thank you to our other guests this week, Susie Gage, Hannah Reynolds, and Ben Sessa, for helping guide our little trip through psychedelic science. 
And finally, we've just got time for question of the week. This week, there ain't no mountain high enough to stop Sally LePage from tackling this question from listener Wayne. We've always learned that heat rises, but it's normally cooler in the mountains. Shouldn't their higher elevation make it warmer there? Lace up your hiking boots and pack your energy bars as we're heading up to high altitudes. And our expedition leader to guide us towards the right answer is atmospheric physicist Simon Clark. Hot air rises because it's warmer than surrounding air yet under the same atmospheric pressure. Air pressure and temperature are connected via some rules that describe how all gases behave. Specifically, they say a pocket of air at the Earth's surface that's warmer than its surroundings must be less dense than its surroundings. And so, like a bubble of less dense air in a swimming pool of very dense water, it rises above the surrounding air. I see. Heat rises at ground level because it is less dense than the air around it. But Wayne is right. It is much colder up in the mountain tops. So what is different at higher altitudes? To make things more complicated, however, as air rises in the atmosphere, it also cools. This is because as it rises, it's subject to less and less atmospheric pressure. Atmospheric pressure is just the weight of air above pushing down on you. And so the higher you go in the atmosphere, the less pressure you experience. And what effect does there being less pressure pushing down on me, pushing down on you, have on hot air? As a bundle of warm air rises through the atmosphere, there is less and less air above pushing down on it. This release of pressure allows the air parcel to expand, and in the process, cool down. The higher a pocket of air rises in the atmosphere, the cooler it becomes. Generally, a parcel of warm air will only rise so far before stopping, having cooled to the point where it is the same temperature as its new surroundings. This means, according to the rules describing how gases behave, that it's the same density as its surroundings, and so has no motivation to rise any further. This process, known as adiabatic cooling, combined with the fact that the atmosphere is heated from below by the Earth, means that the atmosphere gets colder as you get higher and higher, and hence why mountaintops are cold. So that solves it. Hot air rises because it is less dense than cold air, but the higher up it goes, the more it cools down, leading to snow-capped mountains. Next week's question might be a little more hairy, as Beth asked... My dog is always licking her fur but never gets a hairball. Why don't dogs get hairballs? Can you help cough up an answer to Beth's question? If so, come join the debate on our forum, nakedscientists.com forum, or if you'd like to ask us a question, we're on chris at nakedscientists.com. And I'm afraid we must leave it there. Next week, we're going to be asking what's a bee's favourite flower, what do your genes have to do with your body odour, and much more as we go behind the scenes of the Royal Society's Summer Science Exhibition. For more from The Naked Scientist, head over to our website, nakedscientist.com. You can also follow us on social media. We're at Naked Scientist. And why not leave us a review wherever you get your podcasts? The Naked Scientist comes to you from the Institute for Continuing Education at the University of Cambridge and is supported by Rolls-Royce. I'm Phil Sansom, and from all of us here at the Naked Scientist team, thank you very much for listening, and goodbye! <laughs> <laughs>